Now, let us start the panel discussion, the last session for today. You can see the panel members on the program, and they are up on the stage. And the moderator will be uh, Mr. Kazuhiro Hayashi from National Institute of Science and Technology Policy. And I'd like to hand the microphone over to Mr. Hayashi to moderate the session. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Gentlemen, I am Hayashi from Nine Step. The Spark Japan uh, Steering Committee is what I have been sitting, and also I have been the chief and also organizing committee of this uh, symposium. And uh, uh, this will be the last uh, session for all the Spark Japan programs for this fiscal year. And uh, it's very rare that we still have enough time for a panel discussion. Usually what happens is that there's only 30 minutes left uh, only for a panel discussion, but we are uh, uh, surprisingly uh, on time. And so uh, it gives me a, a chill. Uh, and I'd like to talk about what we have discussed and um, open science uh, review um, that has been the grand uh, theme for this fiscal year, and I don't have any uh, specific idea, but I'd like to dig into this topic together with the panel members. And there are questions uh, submitted beforehand, but uh, Ron has been observing what we have discussed, uh, how much progress we have made in Japan. So I'd like to ask Ron to uh, give his thoughts on what he has observed in Japan. Uh, so I'd like to ask um, Ron to give us his comments. Comment about our presenters. Uh, thank you. Um, today, f for me, it, it was very, very useful. I, I learned a lot. Um, and I want to start with a statement. It, it was also made today not to make hasty decisions. And I think it's in the RDA report on riding the wave, which says, if you don't understand yet what you are deciding upon, don't make a decision yet. And today, we got a lot of information. I got a lot of information and uh, understanding and got an overview of what's happening in the Japanese landscape on open science. And there is a lot of information already available. I think there is a lot of building bricks, uh, infrastructure, even governance uh, are available. And um, perhaps still we need, you need to get even more understanding by having pilots, uh, we've seen some today, um, to have discussions and to get more understanding. And at the same time, it's the challenge to set goals and to set ambitious goals. When we started with the Dutch presidency, we said we thought we had ambitious goals. And then it turned out that we reached 95% of these goals. So I think we could have been even more ambitious. And it's not a disaster if you don't meet your uh, preliminary goals. But I think be ambitious and um, start this uh, combining of the, of the building bricks. And there can be different goals on openness. It was discussed what kind of openness be specific on that and um, about who are the users, who reads the papers, who is reusing the data. And perhaps you could find early adopters on reusing data or find ambassadors to enlarge the community. Because as also Peter Suber said, the largest uh, barrier on open science is misunderstanding. And I think this outreach is very important. And um, at the end, we saw some very, very nice examples like this Odin and this JPC OAR, this promotion committee. I think these are excellent initiatives to move forward, 
to set ambitious goals and also to set framework conditions. What are you willing to do? Under what conditions? And that could be to have or to keep control on ownership. I think that is an important one coming up, even for, especially if you want to do, talk about text and data mining. And it's important to keep the markets open. I think in publishing, there is hardly a, a market anymore, at least in Europe, where some publishers determine what's happening and the libraries have to pay. And we want to keep the market for data open. And for that, we need to have many users, many producers. And I think, as I said, we need intermediates. We need this, like the librarians. We need Odin to facilitate connecting producers and users. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very um, encouraging comment to Odin team. Thank you very much for your comment. So uh, I think it was uh, Ono-san that said that Japan is not that much behind. Uh, we have been working on various initiatives, and uh, those have been down-to-earth approach, and we have been able to demonstrate what we have uh, done to Rome. So uh, now uh, is the time for us to start discussions that are relevant internationally as well. So the questions are quite varied and it's very difficult to summarize and uh, combine the questions. So uh, it's going to be a hard question from the start. Uh, Mr. Ono's presentation, uh, making the data, uh, making it uh, data open, mandatory to in a too much hurried away, uh, that would be a wrong idea. That was the question, and I like to ask. And he, the questionnaire, uh, uh, the person who asked this question would like to know their thoughts. And uh, Mr. Ono already shared his views. What about the other members, Ogasaka san? Uh, I think uh, he, you had uh, your uh, unique uh, view on this originally. Well. The answer is yes and no. It's uh, really about the policy that you adopt. As you know, in terms of open science, in Europe, it's been top-down approach mostly, whereas in the US, the community-driven approach has been taken. So it's just a question of which policy you would like to take. And the most important is that if you would like to proceed that uh, as a policy, you can uh, do so and to make it mandatory, but uh, the government has to be held responsible for the result. And uh, you force the b researchers to change their behaviors. If that's the case, then that could, if you think that that would uh, uh, contribute to the better competitiveness, then you should do so. But you have to also uh, be accountable for the result and consequences. But my personal view, having said that though, is that uh, researchers are the kind of uh, people who would just pursue whatever they want to. And if they don't accept any policy, then uh, the policy wouldn't uh, survive. And that's how JST has been proceeding uh, from the very beginning. That's all. Any other comments from the panel members on this point? Omukai-san. Well, uh, as uh, from the technical point of view, I'd like to share my view. Well, the policy without any technical solution uh, should be avoided, uh, in my view. So laws and regulations and institutions and systems, of course, you need all of this to uh, set up the framework. But if there's no technology to back them up, then it just... Uh, add to the cumbersomeness and the uh, extra efforts uh, which could distract the researchers uh, from their main uh, work and they have to spend um, more time in those uh, uh, supplementary work and uh, their 
productivity could be undermined. So you have to come up with the solutions to back up any policies that would be laid out. Certainly, it, well, come to think of it, in Japan, in many cases, we tend to be bottom up. So, the, according to some discourse by uh, the, one of the OSTP members, if you uh, depend too much on the bottom up approach, it does not lead us to anywhere. So, we have to have character and stick. So, again, stick is needed. And again, we have seen many tips in order to drive and accelerate the approaches, bottom-up approaches. Are there any things that you can consider? So are there any things that you can think of in driving the bottom-up approach? Would you like to make, it, make a comment, Mr. Kitamoto? Yes, the open science is very important. Both open access is a key, and the, that's my approach. But as to the bottom-up approach, well, it depends on what we mean by bottom-up. So the, in terms of economics, the most, the, the optimal the, the approach by each individual would not constitute the uh, total uh, the optimization. So this would be the fallacy of composition. If you are only thinking about the maximization of the benefit for the parts, then this does not constitute the optimization of the, uh, t the entirety. So the, if you try to work on the maximization of open science of individuals, then it doesn't lead to anywhere. So I think it is important to look at the entire community and try to work on the open science. And then this might not be related to the uh, optimization of the openness for individual, but if you try to see the entire community as a whole, then it is possible. So uh, perhaps the top-down approach could be needed, so the top the personnel should think about something that is needed. So research communities' way of thinking should need the, uh, the behavior of the research community. Center what? Center of Science in Varanasik talked about this. So in thinking about open science framework, the, he said that we should not, we should be moderate. If you be, uh, are too the forward leaning, then people would not be able to follow you. And if you are the slow, then people would be bored. So it is important to run just ahead of the first runner. And then this way, uh, you are able to lead the entire group. So that's the kind of approach Japan should t adopt. Is it ever possible for Japan to adopt this kind of an approach, Mr. Ono? Uh, the, uh, perhaps you can say this is the, the cake in the sky? Or do you think it is any the uh, approach that, that is viable in Japan, which is expansionary? Well, researchers would not change themselves if, uh, if he or he, she is not instructed. So if not instructed, they would try to continue doing whatever is suitable for them. And I said that it is better not to uh, make it mandatory right away. So I think it is better not to tell them to submit it to uh, or obligate them to provide OA. So Mr. Osaka has been doing this in the DMP. It is important to start from the thinking process. So the, the most important is open by default. And the, then with this in mind, the, uh, we have to ask them to think about the reason why they can't do that. So the, it is it better not to have the obligation the, of, of data sharing or the uh, open access. But even if uh, the, we say that, and if they don't follow, and then in that situation, as was mentioned earlier, it is important to have a mandatory uh, the implementation of the open access led by the government. And then after that, it is important to revisit this. So if the, uh, to verify the result, if it is not the uh, successful, it's uh, we have to re the to uh, decide not to continue. So again. If the, there is a mandatory action by the government, and then the, the government is also responsible for working on the verification for the outcome of their activities and the policy measures. Then, Ron, would you like to make a comment on this? In Japan, we have the bottom-up approach. This is 
So if the government does certain things, then in that situation, the policy should be made and then the, the government should be held responsible for what they would do. So that's a kind of the logic here. And then, on the other hand, in Europe, you have Horizon 2020. By the year 2020, the open access should be realized 100%. That's clear, this, the distinction between Japan and Europe. So there has been a decorrelation of the policy. So who is responsible for this? And then in what way would the result be checked or verified? Could you make a comment? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, when we run the Dutch presidency, one of the factors for success is that we had an inclusive approach. So it was political backup. It were the universities and funders who said, we want open access. Mm -hmm. And we even had some of the publishers saying, we want to change too. And then you have an inclusive coalition uh, with uh, a common goal, and then you can move on forward. And I would like to have the combination of this top-down approach where you are very careful for uh, producing red tape, but you can be very clear on, on, on what you want. If the Dutch Research Council says we want immediate open access, that is very clear to everyone. And last week we had a young researcher saying, I don't mind if it's mandatory, because that means it goes for everyone. If it is not mandatory and I do something, I do extra, and my colleagues who don't have, the, uh, they have more time for doing what they were doing before. So if you want me to change, make it mandatory, and then everyone is uh, induced to change. And, and scientists are like humans. They don't like to change very much. And sometimes you must give direction and that is what we tried to give this political statement and the statement by the funders saying we want it. There is uh, a time to, to get used to it. We have pilots and at some moment in time, it's just obligatory, just like the Gates Foundation saying, if you get money from us, you publish open access, period. So that's the situation here. Top down it can be done, but still we ha with care. So to a certain extent, top down approach is needed to be combined with the bottom up approach. So if I say that, then the, from the position I am standing, or the, the from the position I belong to, this might be problematic. But still, I think that this is a kind of procedure that we have. Well, I am. The, uh, trying to the, uh, work on this from the next step, they try uh, trying to promote this uh, top-down approach. Then this is a very uh, the high-level approach, and this is a question to uh, the, the questions for the Ms. Onodera has been the uh, largest in number. So since she she has been involved with many things, uh, the concrete manners. So the uh, this is a small question. So in your, you were talking about the concrete the the data management tool. So what is the benefit or the the disadvantages of using the the uh, proprietary system. So this is a quick question. We have been doing this in a proprietary system, and then that means that the, the, we were able to supplement what is lacking in the the uh, the openware. So the the things that were available were not enough and not in line with our expectations. So that's the reason why we came up with something uh, internally. Uh, the disadvantages are none, because even if there is a disadvantages, they, then within the community, we were able to solve these problems. So that's the process with which we, we do not see many conspicuous uh, the, the, the deficits. So maybe the, the maintenance of the uh, motivation would be the uh, factor. So if many people are the driving the uh, activities, or if everybody is motivated, it's okay. But if that person is the transfer to other the positions, then in that situation, you, you might face a problem. In many cases, you have to, you have no other choice but to use the voluntary personnel. Well, if you have the person reshuffling and the, the person responsible for that is gone, that could be a problem. But in the case of NIMS issue, NIMS case, the, it was not a small uh, in the group with a small number of people. So in the uh, measurement system, the, the we have a, our community with a large number of, of people. So that means that the, there was no problem. It is not dependent on the 
uh, the exercise of one individual. Even if one person leaves, it doesn't stop. This would not be a showstopper. So you have to make sure that there is no, no this kind of things would not be, uh, would not stop the activities. So again, this would lead to the previous comments. Uh, I was not thinking about this, but still, this is, is a very good answer. Thank you very much. And uh, there are some questions about the copyrights, for example. In NIMS uh, case, uh, there was a distribution based on free of charge. So what will be the criteria? Uh, of the use. Uh, are there any policy on the part of NIMS is the question. I think you did cover that, but could you repeat what you said? Okay. The difference in use? Well, actually, it's the researchers that makes the choice, right? It's not that uh, NIMS as the institute guides one way or another. Am I correct? As an institute, right. And I guess that, that is uh, the same for DS as well. It's up to the researchers, right? Uh, the level of uh, uh, openness is uh, up to each researcher, is what I'm told, right? Yes, that is correct. The data provider has the choice. At least that will be the primary deciding factor, yes. Then if it's limited uh, access. Uh, and uh, so moving on to business sustainability, if the data is made uh, publicly available for a charge. So a question uh, for Onodera-san. I think you talked about a UK company. Uh, yes, it's the UK company that is getting the money. And you get part of the money at NIMS as well? Yes. Uh, how many percentage? I don't know. Uh, I conducted some interview to prepare for the presentation, and I didn't ask that question, so I don't have the answer. I see. Because I think that will be critical, because uh, this questioner says that in my area of expertise, database, uh, are being sold for a fee even to researchers that is getting the way of disclosing information, uh, says this person. Uh, uh, and then uh, there are some of the businesses, not-for-profit businesses, which I think is a major topic in data research. So, Ono-san, I know that you uh, are not the right person to be answering this question, but can you uh, share your comments? I think you did talk about some cases of selling the softwares. Uh, any outlook projections? That's hard to say. Because AGS itself, uh, we have started the uh, considerations as to how we the operation could be autonomous, uh, but uh, we're still in the phase of uh, consideration. Uh, I think th there are different options in charge of how to charge. Uh, charge on a data basis. I don't think that would work. I don't think people will be willing to pay for certain data. So how can we charge the users is a critical question. Uh, I think it depends on how the users want to use the data. Uh, in our case, uh, we have uh, the uh, data related to Earth observation. So applications uh, that are conducive to the Earth observation research. Uh, if that is available, I think the users will be happy uh, and that will contribute to uh, the advancement of Earth observation, which will uh, be beneficial to society. So 
regarding the application development itself, maybe we can charge the users for the application development. That's what I have in mind right now. On the other hand, in terms of business sustainability, which is not clear yet, uh, I think there is a concern of just building up on research data. For example, looking at this question, uh, isn't there a risk that uh, this uh, repository will be used as uh, the uh, backup uh, data repository by the researchers? Any comment on that concern? that it will be used only as a backup database. Well, before that, there is a question of how you register the data. We're still in that phase. But uh, sooner or later, uh, we are going to be in a situation uh, where uh, all the data will be dumped in there. And therefore, we'll have to think about disposing of the data. Or am I ahead of myself? Uh, one concern that I have regarding DMP is exactly that. Uh, when we say submission is mandatory, uh, maybe uh, researchers will start uh, submitting data, uh, token data, just for the matter of formality. Uh, right. Uh, so there is a risk of that happening if we uh, hastily uh, do this on a top-down approach. Right. In the case of DS, we do have selection. Uh, but the question is, to what extent can you do that selection? For example, Figshare. Uh, I think that's uh, the situation there. So I think that's a quick question. So we should design the system so that it won't happen, that it won't be used as a backup, backup dump site. Uh, I think similar things happened in, with regards to IPR in the past. Uh, the uh, basic researchers uh, were really not concerned about uh, intellectual property rights in the past. And then the government said, well, that's not the right way, and therefore TLO uh, should uh, uh, intervene. And JST uh, uh, did have the business of supporting activities, programs to support uh, the patent application. Uh, but the cost became uh, just... Uh, uh, exponentially high. And so uh, we thought that we should not try to get IPR on everything. But now universities are saying that only licensable, the things that could be licensed could uh, go to IPR. But now uh, we're the pendulum is swinging in the other direction. I don't know whether we're going to converge, uh, but uh, I think we're going to see a good balance being maintained. So with regards to the research data, I think there is a trade-off with the uh, cost and the benefit. Uh, I think uh, we are going to uh, see a reasonable conclusion being reached. So Ron, about this question, in Europe, is there a discussion to what extent you are going to store data and how you're going to dispose of data? Are, are you already way ahead in that discussion, or are you still in the phase of having data being registered? Where are you in Europe in this whole process? I think this uh, depends a lot by discipline. Discipline. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I, I've, in, in, in the big science, uh, the big data science, physics, uh, life sciences, there are many protocols for keeping your data. And there is an obligation by the universities. Uh, it's a code of conduct to keep your data for 10 years. And it's, it's a kind of strange discussion, because think of any sector uh, having part of your production process where you just throw away your data, which were part of this process. If, if, if that would be in a private sector, the, you would be fired. <laughs> so um, I think it's it's a matter of doing good research to uh, be accountable for what you have done. And we in the Netherlands had a big fraud case in psychology where a professor, a high esteemed professor, just made up the data. So, um, and the only way to find out is uh, uh, getting these data 
and he was very reluctant giving the data. The, 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 the surveys were disappeared. He had moved from a house to another house and he forgot. And uh, it, finally, when he handed over the data, then they could see that these were uh, fake data because it, uh, it was under the statistical moments that you could see they were all the same in, in the third and fourth moment. And that made a discussion that you should keep your data for reproducibility. And the other discussion is to, <clears throat> to, to, to share your data for reuse. And there is no, not much discussion about storing your data. And I think storage is only a minor part of the costs. The costs are in the hours of work by the researchers, by the assistants, to uh, keep track of the data, to describe the metadata. Mm -hmm. And um, moreover, in the, at least in the Netherlands, because IPR is very complicated, but in the Netherlands, the right holder for the data is the one who finances the data. So it is the funder or the university. And that they can be held responsible to keep track of the data. So um, I think the, the, the challenge is in making data findable to, 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 to tell other researchers how these data can be reused. And then this discussion, should I, should I keep the data or not, that, that, that will disappear. And the focus will be on what data are of good quality can I re reuse. I think that will be the discussion. Thank you for your comment. Uh, maybe we have been uh, a bit narrow-minded in our discussion so far in Japan. So to change the subject slightly, in the topics for today, one of the major ones is a research platform, Welcome Trust, what uh, Welcome Trust has uh, set up like the one of Welcome Trust or preprint server archiving expansion. Uh, there are several questions that we received on this topic. Uh, questions to uh, Professor Ono. The preprint server, uh, the publishing of papers without going through journals, if that is the option, then that could make do you think that would make the, the world for researchers better one, better place? Well, you may not be the representative of uh, hold all the researchers, but uh, what do you think? Uh, de depending on the, uh, having the discussion so far, well, it's very hard to say uh, one way or the other. But I don't know how to put it. But the preprint server. Uh, can be used to upload your papers to, and that activity if that activity is appreciated and rated highly, then there may be some researchers that will come on board. However, in most of the cases, the researchers uh, do have um, the uh, first priority to the journals with a certain authority. I think that would be the goal for them to post their papers to, uh, in many cases, on the other hand. Uh, what I have um, uh, heard is that Peel's one, uh, it's uh, uh, relatively open and relatively easy to uh, submit the papers to. And uh, once the number of uh, submissions has increased, but uh, then again, it has declined. So the popularity has uh, subsided. So now, the preprint server it may be uh, popular, but uh, it may not last so long. Thank you very much for a very frank view.
But、uh, on the other hand, as Mr. Kitamoto said, in the deep learning world, speed is really important. And、uh, there is no time for peer review、uh, in the extreme case. So, in the new disciplines、uh, that may work, is that、uh, the only disciplines where that work or would that affect established disciplines? That is something that we have yet to see. Any comments、uh, from any of the panelists? Or if there is any comment or questions from the floor, because this is a new research paradigm or assessment paradigm, a platform to、uh, be conducive to that.、Uh, so, how we can discard the peer review process in a positive way? I, I think it's not discarding quality assessment.、Uh, Welcome Trust does two things. They have Welcome Open Research, which is、uh, publications that are peer reviewed.、Mm -hmm. But the big difference is they publish first and then the review will follow. That's, that's one topic. The other topic is they, they join a coalition of a number of funders that say we acknowledge preprints. and For that, they need the archive or bio archive or、uh, social archive to,、uh, where you can store your preprints. And in some disciplines, it's very important to have a timestamp, I think, especially in biology and, and medicine and health、uh, research, to have a timestamp on, on your result. And it's also on a, meant to capture a trend that you don't need to have a full fledged. Article, introduction, analysis, the data,、uh, the, the outcome, and conclusions. I think articles will be broken up into major results, and with a preprint, you can just publish what normally would be part of an article to publish this result if it is very important and relevant for the research community. And that is exactly what also happened when there was the Ebola crisis. To put the data and the results out as soon as possible in order that the other researchers could take note of it and make conclusions、uh, on how to, to stop this、uh, epidemic disease. Yes, I agree. You just put them out, whatever it is. And、uh, put the timestamp on the result. And after that, you can go through the、uh, conventional peer review process and conventional assessment can be assured. That could be the world that we may、uh, get into. Of course, this also depends on which disciplines you're talking about. But in this overall trend, the research institutes and、uh, em Employees of、uh, universities and researchers themselves, how to develop them is a key question. And that is also another set of questions that we received. Well,、uh, the world where it's given that you put into preprint servers or open platform, and then、uh, peer review could come last uh, afterwards, then the,、uh, it may be necessary to change your policy of hiring the personnel. Is there any such、uh, concept、uh, in place in Japan?、Uh, this person who asked this question seems, sounds very pessimistic. Well, according to this question, so based on the discussion that we've had, the、uh, development and hiring of、uh, librarians for universities、uh, may have to be changed significantly. That's what this question said. But uh, uh, I just interpret this as a, a world where it's given to have preprint server and open platform and the sharing of data and collaboration with progress. If、uh, that's the world that we will be in, by that time, the university personnel and librarians, so in a positive manner, In this、uh, rapidly changing world, how we can adjust ourselves to? That's the question、uh, in the bottom line. Well, that's exactly what、uh, 
the introductory remarks referred to after, before the two presentations. We don't know what is going to happen. Uh, tomorrow, the policies may change because of uh, some external factors, and the optimal information system may change dramatically and fundamentally. Well, in the scientific information area, this may not have been the one that we have experienced so far, but in the uh, IT or Facebook comes and uh, uh, Google comes, and you have to change all the time, and but that would uh, help improve the quality of, of life. Uh, that's the kind of thing that we have experienced in our world. So in recent years, uh, the libraries to information system uh, have been wondering which of the several options that they had to take. That was the only question that may, they may have wondered, and that has been the risky uh, phenomenon. So if there is something that you have to create uh, as a new model, then you have to do it, and you have to be on the side to design and create something new. That is uh, what I wanted to uh, communicate as a message, and that's how we have started that kind of training program several years ago. So what we can do with that training program is not to increase the knowledge, but uh, to make yourself prepared for any new situation that you may face. Uh, regardless of the uh, quality of the solution, you have to come up with some sort of solution to step forward, to uh, address what's coming. Uh, if you have to be uh, well trained and prepared now, uh, so that you can, you shouldn't be afraid of what is coming. Well, the presentations were quite um, uh, impressive uh, when we started the institution. Uh, uh, repository, um, how uh, researchers can commit themselves to research is, is something that we have been considering. Uh, ten years ago, what we had done uh, in terms of communication with researchers is to uh, give us the results of the researches, uh, asking for that. But uh, ten years later, how we can uh, uh, contribute to the research results is something that we are considering. And if that's the case, then in 2027, as a data librarian, what would be the skills required? That was what was presented. But uh, at that time, uh, what a libra librarian can do uh, with a well uh, sought out process, if um, that is the kind of process that we follow, then we could be more positive. Uh, Dr. Kitamoto, if you have any more uh, comments. Thank you. Going back to what was mentioned by uh, Mr. Omukai, the world of web has changed rapidly, whereas on this side of the story, there was no change. So we ha it is high time for us to change. So even if there is a major, major change, then uh, we should not be surprised. As was mentioned by Ron earlier, even if the preprint server is ready, it doesn't mean that the peer reviews would be eliminated. So this is a, the checking mechanism for the quality. Peer review might not be the only option. That's uh, the, uh, the possibility with the, this involvement. But still, peer review could remain. In one sense, you yourself would have to check and then this is uh, the, uh, the peer review is outsourcing. So that means that you ask the peer reviewer to review the quality of the uh, publication. That's what we do. So this could be uh, the, uh, done in parallel way. For example, AI could be able to work on the quality check and quality the, uh, assurance. But it is not the, the peer review that we have to maintain, but rather the process for quality checking. That's the most important. The system of peer review is based on letters. So the, in the past, we had letters and the exchanges of letters, and that's a legacy framework. And we don't have to stick to uh, what we had in the past for in the form of peer reviews. However, having said that, the the, it depends on the uh, the discipline. Pre the, in the higher energetics, the, uh, the there is only one, there are only one hundred people 
So that means that the, there is no need for the uh, the for the peer reviews. So that means that the uh, the in the case of pharmaceuticals, the MP the uh, the chemicals, then it that it means that there are so many people who are reading. So that means that they want to have some the quality assurance. So peer review was very important for my field. So it, it depends on the discipline. However, again. With the, the development of ICT and the, the techni technology savvy people, digital na native people, and hardware and software and human resources, new people would be the, the uh, be able to to function well with the ICT driven world. And then in that situation, what would be the mechanism for the quality check? So that's the point. Now we still have some more questions here. Uh, this is a question to Ron. I'm not sure. Uh, the, uh, I wasn't quite sure how to raise this issue, this question at the right timing. But this is a question to you. In the United States, U.S. first policy is now implemented, about to be implemented, and the the entire government is now getting toward protectionism. So allow me to add, for the environmental researches, would it be difficult for them to submit information? So. The information provision would be difficult if, if the, in the United States. And also, we have to uh, think about Brexit, the UK leaving the, the European Union. So about the remaining member states of EU, do you think they will become protectionists in the years to come? Then, well, there is a, uh, the true fear for that. So against this backdrop, the, uh, you are trying to promote the European uh, the, uh, the open cloud. So, uh, could you uh, tell us? Uh, could you? Uh, so, you are trying to promote Horizon 2020. Could you tell us a bit about it? Okay, thank you. Um, I didn't say that the U.S. is protectionist. I did say there is a world of protectionism coming up. Mm -hmm. So, to make <laughs> it clear, <laughs> um, but 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 still, um, I think if you want to do new to to investigate on new knowledge you have to be as open as possible in the early stage. And if you want to make money, it's okay that in some phase you say, now I keep the knowledge and I go for the patent or the license and I want to make money out of it. But the example I gave on this structural genome in the, uh, organization, if even the pharmaceuticals who are highly competitive decide to work together because it becomes too complicated, too expensive to do the work on your own. That's an important signal by, by an important sector who, which is very big and in talking money. So I think you have to create these win-win situations. What's in it for me and what's in it for you? So what's in it for us together? And I think on reusing data and doing research, that should be could be a driving force. And I think research will survive uh, elections. Then there will be in two years a new Congress, in four years another president, etc. cetera. Um, universities ne next to the Catholic Church are the oldest organizations, and they survived for 1,500 or more years, and they will survive in the future. But change is getting more faster and faster. And if, if you are uncertain about what is the direction, then perhaps let, well, not 1,000, but some 10 or 50 flowers bloom and start trying. And that is what I see in the US. They start trying, and they are willing to stop initiatives if they don't work, but they build up expertise. And I think that is the best way to prepare for an uncertain new future. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for a very encouraging remark. So that's all I was supposed to cover. I was not able to take up all the questions, but the, uh, I think I, I am here. And I still have 10 more minutes. So I, I think I can take questions from the floor or maybe comments. Any questions or comments from the floor? If not, well, I thought that you were very enthusiastic. 
Are you sure? Yes. Thank you. I raised this question this morning. My name is Fukagai. I just wanted to raise one more question from the floor. I was very much encouraged with the presentation you have given us to us. Whenever we talked about the open sciences, the, the, there have been some the problems as to where to start on the side of the, the, uh, the libraries. And then researchers tend to, to be in the trap believing that they have to produce their own outcome, good outcome, in order to be able to survive. So based on the libraries, the, so there could be many people who have been working on the new initiatives, including the libraries. That was quite encouraging. So we do have the scientific research the projects and the programs, and in many cases, researchers tend to stick to their own the uh, results or the outcomes. But the, these people are very uh, traditional and very conservative. But there could be many new people. The people would be uh, new people would be open to the new way of doing things, and you have created new platforms. So you have new the uh, systems in which you are able to collect data. So on a trial basis. And also, the, as a user, uh, there could be a system in which uh, people would be able to use other people's data. So I think it is better to start the uh, pilot. For example, the, the, you might want to depend on the people who have good understanding for that. So you have to, spend the, you have to depend on the researchers who are the, able to, the, uh, the, to try out new things. And also, you can, uh, the, you can the, uh, ask the, uh, the professors who are using and who are the teaching many graduate students. So graduate students will be ready to use all these things. And also the, for the, uh, the undergraduate students who are the, I'm not too, uh, under, for the undergraduate you, uh, students who are who have not been able to uh, to establish their own way of doing things. So the um, perhaps the Oden can be used. So this way uh, we are able to uh, try out whether it is possible to use it beyond the disciplines. So again, you have to start with the the intra the uh, with uh, contacting the professors and teachers and the faculty members. So may maybe you might want to in involve this. So the, you can come up with a sample. Then this way you are able to proceed. Perhaps you might see some, you might see some problem, but still it also is a very good experience. Thank you very much for your comments, Mr. Hukagai. You are still a director of the library. Oh, you, and uh, that till last uh, last year. So the, you are over, not the uh, you are no longer a director of the uh, library. So uh, that was the very supportive the comments from the former. The library director. I think it is important to accumulate the, uh, the cases. So, Ron, they, I think you talked about Foster. So, I think the uh, what he said is the uh, related to Foster. So, young people are are the urged to use open data in order to tackle with their researches. Could you, uh, could you? Uh, so, I think he was uh, talking about this. The, so, this is the introduction. So, maybe. Uh no comment is needed. I just wanted to mention that you do have similar uh, attempts in EU. I wonder if there are any questions or comments on anything else. If not, the theme is re-examining open science. And yesterday, I had already warned the members of the panel about this. Uh, about uh, what we talked about today, as well as uh, looking back on what we did uh, in Spark Japan this year. What is open science to you? What does open science mean to you? I already warned you about this question yesterday, so I'd like to ask each individual to comment on that. Is it hard? Uh, I think it will be easier if you answer. Uh, ahead of us. Uh, Ron, you're going to go last. So any of the Japanese panels? On the part of JST, to maximize the uh, outcome of research, we will do whatever. So any of the things that are provided would be open science. I, I often say this, but 
Uh, I'm afraid we don't have balanced stakeholders. What we're missing is domain scientists, uh, people uh, who don't have literacy in this discussion has to be part of this discussion. And we also need evaluators, people who can assess the whole process. That's what I hope to see going forward. Thank you. Who's going to go next? Yes. I might be repeating what was said. The owners of the data people who have the data in the case of material science what can be shared and what cannot be shared there are both so for those that can be shared the owner of the data should be able to control the use of the data uh, I think uh, I'm hoping that we can have a mechanism where the owner of the data can follow up uh, on the use of the data to get information on how the data that person provided is being used because that doesn't exist now. Researchers, make sure that the data that provided that they provided would uh, go fall in the hands of unintended community. I'm hoping that that kind of system, assurance system, would be established. Well, actually, I was not warned of this question because I was not there yesterday. But as Onodera-san said, uh, I'm afraid uh, I sent out a wrong message earlier. Uh, I did say we don't want to be hasty but it doesn't mean that we are not going to submit the data. What I'm saying is that there are data that can be submitted and there are data that cannot be submitted. And some of the data that can be submitted later. Uh, so you're talking about embargo, yes. What I said was we don't want those data that cannot be submitted today uh, is required to be uh, submitted today because they are data that cannot be submitted, cannot be uh, submitted. So uh, we're hoping that you will ask uh, why we cannot submit. And uh, we would provide the answer. And what is not available today will be available in the future. And I'm very positive about that. Earlier when I said we shouldn't rush, uh, we shouldn't haste, uh, but uh, uh, that person earlier uh, commented that maybe we should interface with undergraduate students who don't have any prejudice. I totally agree because the younger uh, generation, uh, they are open-minded. They say that, yes, I'm willing to share the information. Maybe they go too far, but, uh, you know, over time, the generational change is going to take place. So I think going forward, we are going to see progress in this field. So after some time, I think some of the issues that we face today will be resolved. So uh, I think we should be patient. So librarians, rather than trying hard to work with the people, the researchers who are one willing, maybe it will be easier and faster to work with a more flexible researchers who are more willing to cooperate with you. And uh, as Gasawa san said, uh, open science discussion uh, needs uh, more people. Uh, you said that domain researchers are still not part of a community. And I think uh, economics and the legal experts uh, are still missing in this argument, at least in Japan. Uh, I was uh, involved in data sharing a discussion, and there were economists, uh, and there were some of the uh, legal experts as well. And we have to think about the business sustainability, and uh, the legal expertise is needed as well, because researchers are struggling uh, regarding uh, uh, the uh, some of the legal aspects. So 
maybe this is the kind of area that the government should really provide support. Uh, what kind of uh, use uh, data, use uh, uh, rules uh, would be needed or agreements? When it comes to licensing, uh, I did talk with lawyers, and they tell me that, uh, uh, again, uh, there are silos uh, amongst the attorneys in the areas of areas of, uh, in terms of uh, areas of expertise. Uh, lawyers have their areas of expertise, uh, and so we need the lawyers who are uh, familiar with what we're talking about, right? Uh, I don't have any deep thoughts about this, but uh, open data, open access, open science. Uh, but I've been involved in that whole movement for quite some time. Open means do this with a smile. Uh, you know, to be more open is not something uh, that uh, you should do with a frown on your face. Uh, rather, you should be more positive and say, if it's open, you can do this, you can do that. So you should be more positive. Things that were not visible in the past are now visible, and therefore you can adapt. In that process, uh, that should make you happy. Uh, when you talk about open versus closed, if it's uh, only either uh, open uh, either of the two, uh, then uh, you would uh, uh, think that it's going to be more costly and therefore you would be negative. Uh, and looking at the uh, internet, I have a feeling that uh, that was a driver for success. So when it comes to open science as an experience, how can you experience that? How can you feel that? What uh, you have to think of what experience uh, would uh, make you more familiar with uh, open science. Maybe we can focus on that as well. Thank you. Kitamoto san. Well, open versus closed. Uh, by Well, there are things that are better to be open. There are things that are better to be closed. Uh, but due to historical reasons, we see an opposite situation. And therefore, I don't think we necessarily see the right balance. It's not that it's everything open, everything closed. Uh, but uh, maybe we should really reconsider what should be open and what should be closed. Because in reality, we might see some of the things that are being closed that really should be open uh, for economic reasons or whatever reasons. I think I have talked about giants, shoulder of giants is uh, what you do uh, in research. Uh, I'm quoting Newton. So how do you create giant shoulder? That is a major issue in science. Sometimes that should be left to individual. Sometimes it should be a collective group efforts. And group efforts would involve open science. Uh, but uh, artificially, we have created barriers uh, forcing individual effort and resulting in unnecessary competition. And I think it is important that open science is brought about in that area. Thank you. Oh, I very much agree with your statement about it. Sometimes it's individual, sometimes it, it's a group. For me, open science, as I said at the, at the beginning, is a way that science will change. Whether you want it or like it or not, it will change. And I think it's up to a university or a country 
to jump on that train and to make full use of it. And I think Japan has all the ingredients, all the building blocks. You have excellent infrastructure, you have bright people to jump on that train and make full use of it. And you are used to innovate and come up with new products. But now it's science which has to innovate. So jump on that train. And just speaking for the Netherlands, I wouldn't wait until the government. I would invest in young people. So we are pressed to a start, but uh, in the first Spark Japan, uh, we talked about uh, research paper, open science, uh, open access, gold uh, uh, and green access, and we have uh, mostly seen the established idea, but uh, what was surprising was a preprint server or open research platform. Um, after putting that into open research platform, um, you will do the peer review. So this was uh, something that we have never seen. So there's still changes that we're seeing, and it's still in the area of uh, papers and articles. And as for research data, there are various problems with regard to business models. But in Japan, steadily, uh, down-to-earth uh, attempts uh, have been uh, repeated. Of course, we are faced with the challenges, but uh, there will be research infrastructure that will be in place from next year. And as has been said, policy into practice is the next step. Uh, it's high time to go into implementation. And there are a lot of things that have to be implemented more than we can handle. And uh, there are different stakeholders. Uh, for the next five years or next uh, 10 years when uh, before AI spreads, uh, there are things that we can do. And if you can uh, take this uh, message uh, home with you, then uh, I think that our seminar has been successful. And with that, I would like to conclude this seminar. Thank you for your attendance. And please give the panel members a big round of applause once again.